So you've got all the tools for the job and all the relevant qualifications to say that you're qualified to actually do the job. So yeah, that's a recipe for success, right? Or is it? Hmm, I wouldn't say that that is completely true. There's a few skills that you need to run a successful business as a tradesman that can be done without actually having the tools and the qualifications because there's cowboy builders that do it every day. Toolbox talks of electricians, helping electricians reduce stress, gain back time and earn more money. Hello and welcome back to Toolbox Talks for Electricians. I am Ben Poulter, your host, back once again. And the last few podcasts, they've been interviewing other tradesmen or interviewing people that run a business as a tradesman to see how it's done. And there's plenty of tips and tricks on there. So if you haven't checked them out, go back and watch them too. But today, this podcast is all about the skills that you're going to need to advance as a business owner, to be able to run your own business, not just be a qualified electrician, a qualified plumber, a qualified carpenter, to run your own business, there's some skills that are not taught in college. And to jump straight in, money management. You've got to be able to manage your money. The worst thing in the world is doing a job when you've underquoted and you think, oh man, I'm doing this for free. You've got to be able to manage your money to put the right figure in on a quote to make you actually earn money in your business. Otherwise, you might as well work for somebody else. And the thing is, when you give a quote that is just that, it's a quote. You could even go over the top to explain the worst case scenario. Maybe for electricians, if you're running a circuit, then quote to put that circuit in from new. Because you might find out that, yes, you can use the existing wiring. Well, then you can go back to the customer and give them a bit of a discount. And I know, I know, it's not normal to say... Yeah, hang about, there's a bit of a discount. I didn't actually have to use them all the materials. Not, It's not the normal thing to do, but it stands you in good steed sort of thing for future work. If you turn around to that customer and you say, yes, it was £500, but it's going to be 450 they're going to be well happy. And that's the sort of story that they're going to tell their friends and family. Because I'm not saying it's happened all the time, but it has happened a few times where I thought, well, I don't need to charge them for these extra downlights because I don't need 10 downlights in this kitchen. Six is going to be plenty. Because another thing in running your own business that you need to know is knowing your numbers, knowing how much you need to earn. There's no point in going out there and saying, oh, yeah, it's 20 quid. Like 20 quid's not even a drink anymore. You need to know your numbers, exactly how much you need to earn to cover your insurance, to cover your registration, to cover all your tools that you need to upgrade, maybe your kit that you need to personalize, everything you need to cover. And there is a download that I'll leave in the show notes with a little spreadsheet where you can put all your outgoings in and it'll work out exactly your hourly rate, what you need to charge as a tradesman. Because how many times have you turned up to a property and they said, yes, we've got a fault and it took you five minutes because you're good at your job. You know what you're doing. It's taking you five minutes, but you still had to answer that call. You still had to turn up and you had to get your kit out to try and find out what was wrong. And these things still cost money. And even though that job took you five minutes, there should be a minimum charge of at least 50 quid you charge to turn up to a property to do any work. Because 50 quid's around about, I don't know, say an hour's work. And well, it depends how far it is sort of thing. But minimum, minimum you should charge is at least 50 quid. And with all the money that goes in and out your account or in and out as a tradesman when you're running your own business, you need to be able to plan for the future. Plan for when these bills come in for your wholesalers because you might do a 15 grand job and half of that is sort of materials. So when you get paid, you might get a little bit excited if you're like myself sort of thing and go, right, yeah, I've got 15 grand. I'm going to go bang 10 grand on a new motorbike. Yeah, don't do that straight away. It's, I've done it before. A lot of people maybe have. And then when the wholesaler bill comes in, you think, damn, I owe them seven and a half grand. Where are we going to get that from? Because then as well, there is also your van insurance, your van tax and your public liability insurance. There's all these other little things that you need to account for through the year. So maybe every invoice, just take 5% off and write that off to the end of the year. And that'll build up in a little pot and possibly cover most of your expenses through the year. Because then this way, it won't be such a big hit when you come up to say May in the every year when all your bills come out and your insurance renews and your car insurance renews, your public liability renews, when everything renews at the same bleeding month and your skin, yeah, Putting a bit of money aside off each invoice, off each invoice, 
will help you sort of prepare for that. And the next one on the list is going to be time management. You've got to be able to manage your time efficiently because when you're running your own business, it might pick up and it storms ahead and you've got so much to do, so many quotes to do, so many invoices to do, to do. And your sort of time runs away with you. I know that the traditional thing is to work nine to five, Monday to Friday. Not as a self-employed tradesman. Don't work all week. If you're going to work the weekends, fine, do your paperwork then, or if you're going to work, but give yourself a day off to do the paperwork. This is what I'm trying to say. Give yourself time. Because the last thing you want to do is forget an invoice. Because I can guarantee the customer's not going to remind you to say, "Mm, we haven't paid the invoice, unless they want a certificate down the line. They might remind you then. But the customer won't get in contact with you to say, please, can I give you money? You've got to be able to go to them to say, give me the money for the work I've done. Running your own business, there's always something to do. Invoices, certificates, quotes, the VAT return, your self-assessment. There's always something that you've got to do. So if you just give yourself one day a week, if you work seven days a week, well, that's knock it down to six. So you've got that day. Just that day where you're not rushed and you don't have to sit there in the evening and do the work because the evening time, that's for family to put your kids to bed, to maybe chill out, watch a bit of Netflix or something like that because you don't want to get stressed. This is the thing. It it does stress you out when you work, when you're busy and you've got so much to do and you've got phone call after phone call and then you're getting the people ringing you up saying, right, we're ready for electrician now. We need to come around and get it done so it's on the back of your mind. Just jot it down in the diary. So, right, okay, I tell you, I'll be here at this day. So that is a day that I'm going to turn up. You can't pressurise me. But, yeah, sometimes if you've got a spare day, yeah, you can jump on a bit earlier. But it's on your time schedule, your time management. So then when you've got it booked in for the day and you say you're going to turn up at this day, at this time, be punctual and turn up. 100% turn up. It helps your business so much if you turn up on time. Because everyone says it to me. Oh, yeah, we're meant to get this plumber around. We're meant to get this electrician around or someone to come around to do some work, but they just haven't turned up. They said they will when they get a free day. Well, if you're good at what you do, you don't necessarily get a free day. And if you do, with that free day, you're going to do your own thing. You're going to do something else and maybe with your family or go away or spend a bit of time not working. Because if anything that I've learned over the years is all work and no play, yeah, it's a bit stressful and boring. You've got to live your life as well. Also, if you have a reputation of being a tradesman that turns up on time and gets things done, then that's going to go good for building your business. That customer's always going to ring you. They're always going to think, yeah, he's reliable. So I'm going to ring him up. I can count on him to come and get this problem fixed, what I've got, and it'll be efficient. And I won't have to wait weeks because a lot of people, when they phone up, especially with electrics, they want the thing fixing now. I want it fixing today. Like they'd not necessarily want to wait a few time for you a few days or a few weeks. If it's a a quote for maybe a rewire, then yeah, you can book it in within a few weeks. But sometimes if someone says, "Right, I've got a light is flickering, it's pretty annoying," they'll just go and ring anybody that can come that day. So if you can tell someone when they phone up, "Yes, I can come in a couple of days' time at this specific time." And stick to that time. Make sure you turn up on time. If you're going to be running a bit late, let them know. But as long as you book in a time where you can say and be punctual and turn up, that's the main thing what I'm trying to get through. Just turn up. Because so many tradesmen say, yeah, all right, forget about it. Don't bother turning up. Well, they ain't going to get called for any more work, are they? I've got to mention this quickly as well, though, unless it's a call out and you're going to earn a fortune. I've been called out four o'clock in the morning. Yes, it wasn't ideally convenient, but I went and yeah, I had a fortune. With my experience, builders are the worst. They'll get you around to give the customer a quote. You'll give them a quote, say, yes, fantastic. We want to go ahead on this extension. When they've got the shell up, they won't tell you that yet. Ben, we're going to have the shell up in like a week's time or two weeks time. They'll say the day when they've done, right, we're ready for the sparking now. They'll ring you up and expect you to come tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. Not in my eyes, not in my life. I need a little bit of time. I need a couple of weeks at least to say, right, this is when we're ready. I need to book something in. Because nine times out of ten with that plaster, he's got it in his head thinking, right, yep, the electrician's coming in this day, and then the following day we'll book the plasterer. Well, you're going to faff everything up. I don't like working for builders like that, and there is a lot of builders out there that sort of work like that. They want to get done as quickly as possible to obviously get paid. 
So they're going to put the pressure on you as well. Because when things don't get done, they've got to blame somebody. So why not blame the Sparky? That's what a lot of builders are like. And don't be afraid for that builder to go, well, screw you then. We're going to get somebody else. Good. Get somebody else. You don't want to work with builders like that. They stress you out and they pressurize you to get things done. I don't like rushing. I like getting things done just so. Bit of perfectionist. Make sure it's all right because basically you don't want to get, to get faults down the line. You want everything to be spot on. You're happy. It's all clipped, neat and tidy and done effectively, like especially if it's a kitchen, if it's an extension, there's a kitchen in there, you want to get the drawings and make sure that everything's in place for maybe a hob, an oven, a double oven, under cupboard lights, under plinth lighting. You may want to make sure everything's in because the last thing you want to do is them to plaster, skim, paint and finish and go, oh yeah, we wanted some under cupboard lighting. You, you never said that. Oh, oh, oh I thought it though. <laughs> you you know, flipping said it, did you? But it happens, it happens all the time, these things. You get around them but you want to stop these things happening if you can. And you, as the business owner, don't think that you've got to do everything. You can delegate little jobs for everybody else. If you've got a team of people, maybe there might be one guy that's really friendly and chatty with customers and gets on really very, very well with customers, send him out quoting. So, right, take all the details down. You might have to do it a couple of times with them first, but in the long run, that will save you up plenty of time where you could be able to do something else. If he just goes out, or he or she, sorry, goes out, gets all the details for a quote, and they can put a quote together for the job. And then that's sort of something that you don't have to do anymore. Even invoicing, if you've got someone that likes sitting in front of a computer, a younger person maybe in your team that's good on computers, you could sit there and say, like, this is how we do the invoices, and can you do that for me now? This can be your job. You can dictate. Do you be the orchestra, in effect, to dictate for everyone what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. And then you run the business. So you're sort of in control. You're the business owner. So then number three is be the boss. If you're the boss of a business, be the boss of a business. There's no such thing as mates rates. Because if everyone thinks that they're your mate, they're going to want mates prices and you to do them a little bit of a favor. You must have been around a property before where someone says, why are you here, mate? Was you here, famous last words. Was you here, chuck this in, connect that up, do this quickly, do that quickly. No, no, it is a business, man. I'll give you a price to do a job and I'll do that job. You want more work? Then we can do it another time. We'll give you a price to do another job. This is how it works. This is how businesses work. Because you'll soon find out that everyone is your best friend until it all goes wrong or there's money involved. But let's be honest, sometimes things, they do go wrong. Maybe you drill straight through a hole into another room or you put your foot through the ceiling in a loft. Accidents happen. This is the thing. And the best way to take control of that situation is keep your cool. Yep, you're guilty. You have to hold your hands up and say, yes, look, I've made a mistake. I'm going to have to get it fixed. Not a problem, but mistakes do happen, especially when we've got half the floorboards up upstairs. It was bound to happen. You might get the customer that when they see the kitchen, when it's all going in, they think, actually, I want to move it to the other side. <laughs> it's very, very annoying, I understand. But end of the day, the customer's always right. I was in a property once before where I'd spent the day, I'd wired the whole lot to one wall. It was a cooker's, hobs, and well, just everything was on one wall, one side of the kitchen. But the customer came in and he said, yeah, I'll think about having it over there, actually. I thought, well, it's not just a matter of pulling the wires over. It's basically doing the whole job again. So I explained to him, said, look, get in contact with the builder because he's paying me. Let him know what you want me to do and we'll figure it out from there. The builder come round. He kicked off. Oh, my. He kicked off with a customer. Shout, hollered and screamed. I've never seen anything like it. You don't talk to customers like that. If I was a customer, I would have kicked him out of my house. But I don't think you should talk to customers in that manner. Basically, keep your call. Explain to the customer yeah, we can do whatever you want, but it's going to cost you this because originally you said you want it there. It's basically going to have to be redone again. So if that was £500 to put everything there, it's going to be another £500 to put it over there. Probably a bit more because you've got to rip out what's already been put in. I think kicking off with a customer, shout, horror, and screaming at them like kids is not going to make that customer want to recommend you to their friends and family. So number four is communications with maybe your employees, with the customers, with the merchants, with everybody in the know. Keep everybody in the loop. Don't try and hide things. Like if you turn up late to a job, 
then let them know before you get there that, sorry, mate, I'm going to be a little bit late because they might be sitting around hanging around. Or sometimes even if you're not going to make it that day, don't just not go. Let them know. Let the customer know that, that I, ain't, I ain't coming. Like, if it's a builder that's sitting there waiting and say, look, mate, I'm not coming that day. It's not going to get done, unfortunately. You just got to tell them. They might not be happy about it, but things happen. So you've got to be able to tell people that it's bit bad sometimes you say like oh my van's broke down i don't know sometimes people might make things up definitely people make things up i know for definite but you just got to let people know keep people in the loop because when people don't know it leaves a bad impression and they think right i'm just going to get another sparky or another tradesman to do this job next time he is completely unreliable because with modern technology as well you can just give them a text these days to say look I'm running late, mate. I'm not going to be there today. I might be there tomorrow or I'm going to be an hour late. Just a little text. It just makes things easier. And you've let them know. This is the main thing that you've let them know. You've communicated. It's better to do that than nothing at all. And another reason to keep the communication with a customer is to let them know how much it's going to cost if there's extra costs for maybe extra work. If they took their kitchen is getting put in, they say, oh, yeah, I want some undercovered lights now. Well, you didn't quote for undercovered lights. So you'll say, right, okay, I've just got to do that quote for the undercovered lights to let you know how much it's going to cost because then it's not going to be a surprise that it costs you 500 more because I'm putting these fancy LED ones in because no doubt they'll say, yeah, I want LED strips. That's LED strips with red, green, and blue because I want it to be color changing with the controller, with LED profile. So that's going to total up to around 500 quid and when they see that on the invoice the led lights cost me 500 quid we, you asked for all this and so this is what i put in well i have a, i don't want to pay that and then it's, it becomes an argument like you've asked for it so if you get it signed on a bit of paper or just confirmed in an email then it's going to be 10 times better you can say well you've agreed to it like you knew it was going to cost this so then there's no argument after it i've been there before around people's houses where you're doing a job and they say just got a couple of lights I want putting up. Yeah, I can do that. That's so much per fitting. Oh, I just thought you could do it while you're here. Nah, not really. It doesn't work like that. This is, I'm running the business, so if it's extra work, it's an extra cost. It's pretty obvious. So you've just got to explain that to them. And this rolls on to a point number five, is be confident in what you're telling the customer. Say that you go around someone's house and you need to repair an armoured cable. That armoured cable has been damaged with a, a builder digging up the patio. Well, yeah, you need to get the proper kit to seal that in so it's IP rated later on. But you explain to the customer, say, look, this is where it's damaged. So this is what I need to do. I need to reconnect it and I need to test the supply and isolate it. And just to make sure everything's tip top. So if anything happens later down the line, I know that it's all going to be fine. It's all going to work properly. So that entails quite a lot of work, maybe £75 for you to do the job. But then it's, it could double up sort of thing if you've got to test it and things like that as well. So the customer might turn around and say, just stick a connector block in it for now, mate. I'll sort it out later. No, sorting it out later for a lot of customers mean that yeah, I'm just going to leave it like that forever. And they will. If, they put, if you fix it with a connector block and it works... They're, they're going to leave it like that. They're not going to want to spend an extra 75 quid for a, an electrician to come around and join it properly so it can be buried. They're going to stick that connector block on it, put a plastic bag around it and a bit of duct tape and bury it and think that'll do, that'll be fine. Well, no, I wouldn't leave a job like that. And there's a lot of people, a lot of customers that will just ask you to do it. Just shove that in. I ain't got 75 quid at the minute. Let's, I'll do it. I'll do it later on. Okay, then I'll leave it disconnected. I'll safely isolate it. And then you let me know when you've got the money to get it connected because you don't want to leave things done really bodge because you 100% it's going to go wrong later down the line and they're going to call you up. That connection you did, it don't work. Yeah, told you it's crap. Like, it needs to be done properly. And this leads me on to number six, which is networking, not just with other tradesmen. Although, getting along with the other trades on site and basically do making their job easier for maybe plasterers by tucking your cables in the boxes and they'll do the same for you. You'll remember them as being a good plasterer and then they'll remember you as being a good electrician and you can guarantee tradesmen that work in people's houses every day. So if someone says to them, do you know a good electrician or do you know a good gardener? Do you know a good plasterer? You're going to get their number and they're going to recommend you. But then also networking with a customer. 
make sure like after a few weeks of the jobs be completed, if it was a big job, if it was a small job, to be honest, send them a little email to say, hi, I hope you're happy with all the work we did. But then this is a perfect opportunity as well to say, look, would you mind leaving me a Google review? Because they'll open their email up to check, I don't know, maybe for your certificate that you're sending them for the Part P. But then you can say to them, look, do you mind leaving me a bit of a review on Google? And stick a photo in there as well, because that will help you get to the top of Google. It's the small little things that count. I had a guy once where it rewired his whole house and I sent him an email and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got a little problem. You know, the little small bits that you put over the screws in the sockets and the switches, we, we haven't got any. Well, if you're a sparky, you threw me in a bin. You don't bloody put them things on. No one cares. But I was at the wholesaler, so I asked five or six sparkies, ended up with a handful and said, not a problem, mate. I'll pop round and pop them on for a cup of tea. So I nipped round there and I maybe did the kitchen and he said, just give me the rest and I'll do them all. Because it was he saw how easy it was just to pop them on. Hopefully I don't have to go back and uh, do any more work on that bleeding little thing so they ain't ripping them off. But these small little things are what count to a customer. He'll remember that and he'll tell the story to his mate saying, oh yeah, I've got the sparky to come back. Or I had to call him back, I did, because he didn't finish the job properly. What'd he do? Well, he didn't put the little caps on the screws and they'll laugh. It'll be a story to tell his friends and family. Who was that electrician? Because he went out of his way to go and get all these little tabs to put on your switches and sockets just because you wanted them. It's a good score, good story to tell. He'll tell all his friends and say, yes, it was Ben, the electrician. Here's his number. And that will boost your business just that little bit more. So then number seven is know your worth. Know how much you're worth of after all the qualifications you've done, of all the thousands of pounds you spent on tools. Know how much you're worth. Because I've been to places before where they say, right, I want first fix it in. I'll give you 200 quid for first fix and then another 100 quid for second fix. Don't don't dictate numbers to me. It doesn't work like that. I'm here to tell you how much it's going to cost for you, for me to do it. Just because you've Googled on how much electricians should charge for rewrite a kitchen is not necessarily what it's going to cost for me to do it. I'll give you a price of what I'm prepared to do it for, not what you think I'm worth. I know what I'm worth is sort of standing your ground a little bit with other people. In, in with customers as well, they all say it all the time. Got a nice easy one for you. This this should be pretty cheap. Well, I'll give you a price and you tell me whether that's cheap or not. I know exactly what I'll do it for. More than likely not cheap, but it's bloody good. I can give you that. If there's anything that I've learned is that up and down the country, all over the world, electricians earn a different amount of money. There might be different skills sort of thing. There's some electricians that don't even like touching heating wiring. Well, they're going to have to call another electrician in for that, aren't they? So there's certain skills of how, what you're prepared to earn, basically, what your hourly rate is, what you want, what you're happy with getting, it's irrelevant to anyone else. So all these people put these messages out there on a forum saying, how much do electricians charge in Manchester? Why do you care? Why does it matter? If you need to earn £20 an hour, happy days, mate, you're doing well. £20 an hour is all right. But if you can get paid £50 an hour, because that's what you need to earn, that's what you're happy to turn up and get the job done for, then charge £50 an hour. Other than that, don't worry about anyone else. I've had it before. What customers say... Yeah, I know an electrician that'll do it for half as much as what you want. Well, why are you not on the phone to him? Why is he not at your house? Why am I here? Like, that's a good question to ask him. So check out in the show notes below, and there'll be a few downloads that might help you run your business a little bit better. Until next time, see you again.